Welcome back to the series where we're exploring how your brain must function. A fast, dynamic, interconnected network of knowledge. Not a backpropagation neural network or a predictive code. Not an LLM. Not a knowledge graph. Not a swarm of a thousand brains nor a quantum collapse engine. These theories sound intriguing, but they fall apart when you ask how the brain could possibly implement them with biological neurons and synapses and operate fast enough given that neurons are so slow. The only viable architecture is an information graph of relationships, nodes and connections, logic and context, all encoded in neurons and synapses. Now you've undoubtedly heard that neurons that fire together wire together. The problem? It just isn't true. In this video, we'll take a hard look at Hebbian learning and its successor, Spike Timing Dependent Plasticity, or STDP. These learning mechanisms are often quoted as if they're all you need, but they're not, and in this video, I'll show you what else is needed. I'm Charles Simon, longtime AI researcher, software developer, and manager. Beyond AI, I've developed software for neurological test instruments and neurosimulators. I created the Future AI Society to explore how neuroscience can inform smarter, more human-like AI, and I'm using our open source brain simulator project for simulations and demonstrations throughout this video series. If you want to experiment on your own, you can download the Brain Simulator 2 from GitHub and try out these neural circuits and suggest improvements. The principle of neurons that fire together wire together is one of the most widely quoted phrases in neuroscience and artificial intelligence. Attributed to Donald Hebb, this phrase symbolizes the process of synaptic learning. However, it is deeply misleading. Hebb's actual words were more precise. When an axon of cell A is near enough to excite cell B, some metabolic change takes place such that A's efficiency is increased. This isn't a simple co-firing rule. It implies causality. It's not enough for A and B to be active at the same time. A must help cause B to fire and the relative timing of their spikes matters immensely. This refinement is formalized into the more biologically plausible rule of spike timing dependent plasticity, or STDP, in which the precise timing between presynaptic and postsynaptic spikes determines whether a synapse is strengthened or weakened. STDP captures some details, if neuron A fires before neuron B by a few milliseconds, the synapse is strengthened. If A fires after B, it is weakened. However, even this model, though useful, fails to fully account for the complex realities of how synaptic learning occurs in the brain. Let's begin with a demo from the last video showing a simple case where we have a specific synapse and we can change its weight to represent whether or not a cortical column is in use. In this case, neurons within the column have complete control over both sides of our synapse. In this tightly controlled setup, just a few well-timed spikes can drive the learning predictably. This exemplifies it's not that neurons that fire together wire together, it's that the specific relative timing of the spikes at the two sides of the synapse control whether the synapse weight increases or decreases. If the presynaptic spike at A occurs before the postsynaptic spike at B, the weight increases. Otherwise, the weight decreases. But this is an idealized case. Both sides of the synapse are under our control. The learning rate is artificially high, and there are no interfering signals. Real brains aren't this clean. So now imagine we're trying to form a relationship like Fido is a dog. We'll assume that Fido is already linked to a neuron which acts as an AND gate and fires only if both the Fido and the ISA inputs are firing. We'll call that the Fido is a neuron. 
Since everything is a kind of something, let's presume that these types of connections could be dictated by your DNA, as it is the type of wiring needed by every cortical column. So the learning challenge is to connect the phytoisa neuron to the dog output neuron. We'll assume that the phytoisa neuron is innately connected with low weight synapses to thousands of possible things. But we want to strengthen just a single connection to the dog cortical column, which is also spiking because we heard the word dog or saw a dog. But what if the dog column is many millimeters away from the phyto column? Those signals are not going to arrive in sync, and that's a problem because STDP learning is time dependent. If spikes aren't synchronized within a few milliseconds, the synapse won't strengthen. I'm going to show you several solutions with increasing levels of plausibility. You could suggest a neural circuit like this, which synchronizes a signal. If the gate signal is firing, the output will fire one millisecond after the input, whenever the input chooses to fire. This circuit works, but is implausible because, first, it uses a bunch of neurons to perform a simple task, which the brain needs to use everywhere. And second, it requires that some neurons fire more or less continuously, which uses a lot of energy. Recall that neurons consume very little energy except when they fire, so your brain wants to use neuron firing to accomplish something useful, not just wait for a signal which may never arrive. So we introduce the idea of a gate synapse. If a neuron has an incoming gate synapse, that neuron is only enabled if a spike has arrived via that synapse in the previous four milliseconds. So if dog in is not firing, the Fido is a neuron can fire all it likes and nothing will happen. Its signal arrives at the dog out neuron, but never with enough weight to overcome the leakage rate and fire the neuron. When the dog in neuron is firing, the gate is enabled and the spike will arrive at the dog out neuron precisely one millisecond after it arrives from the Fido is a neuron. The ideal delay for fastest learning. It doesn't matter anymore precisely when they fire. If both the Fido is a and the dog in neurons are firing, the synapse weight will increase. This demo shows how gating can help synchronize signals. The downside of this neural circuit is that extra neuron we added for the gating and the needed delay for STDP. Before I get rid of that and make things much cleaner, let me show you another use of the gating synapse. Here's how gating can also suppress extraneous signals during learning. This is crucial in a noisy brain where thousands of neurons are firing all the time. We don't want random activity bollocksing up the learning process. Here we have our classic synapse with set and reset neurons which apply the spikes needed to increase and decrease the weight. It works fine as long as there is no signal from input to output. But if we turn on the input signal, we can never reduce the synapse weight because the input signal itself gets in the way of the reset process. The solution? Another neuron with gating synapses with negative weights this time, which block the input signal long enough for the set or reset to do their thing. Not more extra neurons, you might say. Well, now we have to get rid of all those extra neurons by thinking in terms of processes within the dendrites themselves. This is not resolved research, but it is safe to assume that the gating functions can all occur within the dendrites with no additional neurons needed. We can simplify things further with the invention of a learn synapse. This combines the function of the extra neuron and the gate synapse. If the source of the learn synapse is firing, in this case dog in, then whenever phytoisa fires, the synapse will strengthen. No synchronization required. These have a very useful behavior. 
If a learn signal was recently active, the synapse can temporarily force the target neuron to fire, even if the input is weak or unsynchronized. This might seem like a hack, yes, but it's an effective one. It lets us simulate learning from partial or delayed signals without requiring precise spike alignment. Clearly, your brain must do something like this, even if the specific mechanism is different. Now let's talk about something that's often forgotten. Forgetting. Suppose you've learned that Fido was a dog, but later find out that in actuality, Fido is a cat. You need to unlearn the original connection. But here's the problem. In STDP, weakening a synapse requires that the presynaptic neuron fires after the postsynaptic one. But when you hear that Fido was a cat, the dog neuron isn't firing at all. There's no way to apply the usual timing rule to weaken the synapse. And even if you could trigger the dog neuron artificially, it might fire too late or too early because it's far away and we can't synchronize its signal because we can't anticipate how long it will take for signals to travel down long axons. To solve this, I've added another feature the negative learn signal. When it's active, it forces all connected STDB synapses to weaken, regardless of presynaptic activity. This is not biologically confirmed, but it fills a critical gap, because in real systems you have to be able to forget things. In this demo, we'll simplify our enabler quite a bit. To disable the signal, firing the disable neuron energizes the unlearned synapse and reduces the synapse weight. The enable neuron increases the weight, but only if this input is firing. If we want to enable the signal unconditionally, we can add another synapse which does the trick. Notice this. When we disable the signal, we don't have to reduce the synapse weight back to near zero. It needs only to be reduced just enough so that incoming signals at a maximum firing rate can never exceed the leakage and reach the threshold. That means we can get away with enabling or disabling our signal with a single spike instead of a burst. What a boost in speed! Of course, in real brains, plasticity isn't always on. It's gated by neuromodulators like dopamine, acetylcholine, and neoepinephrine. These chemicals determine when the brain is allowed to learn. You don't want your brain constantly rewiring itself every time neurons fire. That would be chaos. So plasticity is context dependent. It only happens under the right chemical conditions. Our learned synapse mimics this behavior. It only allows synaptic change when the learned signal is active. In your brain, these neuromodulators can either enhance or inhibit learning simultaneously in millions of cells. In our simulations, we can do the same thing with an uberneuron with millions of learned connections. But let's come back to the spatial problem. The brain is big, at least relative to neurons, so neurons that represent related concepts like Fido and dog might be centimeters apart. Signal delays between them could be tens of milliseconds. STDP, however, works on a tiny window, 4 to 20 milliseconds, depending on the system. That's why we need to think in terms of spike bursts and avoiding the need for specific synchronization. So is STDP the whole story of learning in the brain? Definitely not. With my gate and learn synapses, I've modeled a few extensions. And without similar mechanisms, your brain simply wouldn't work. Here are a few other features I haven't mentioned. In the simulator, most synapse weights are reduced very slowly over time. The implication, if you don't think of something to refresh the memory, you'll eventually forget. To preserve really important memories, once synapses increase to a maximum level, they're exempt from the forgetting process. 
In my simulations, I often have synapses with weights of 1, while actual synapse weights max out at perhaps 0.15. It's a feature of the simulator that it only represents a single synapse between any pair of neurons, and the weight of this synapse represents the sum of the weights of multiple synapses which are connected in parallel. This means that the aggregate weight maximum can be precisely controlled by the number of actual physical synapses. A simulated synapse with a maximum weight of 0.6 would be represented by four synapses in parallel with a maximum weight of 0.15. The implication, although the brain can't precisely control a synapse value between its minimum and maximum values, the maximum value itself can be precisely controlled. This feature will become important when I explain how neurons can recognize a thing based on its attributes. From the simulations, you can see that the majority of synapses are fixed weight. This makes up the scaffolding needed for knowledge, while just a small percentage of synapses actually learn the knowledge content. I speculate that all these fixed weight synapses are predefined by DNA. Over time, various brain areas will specialize to process the specific signals they receive, and unnecessary connections may disappear. For this model, I've ignored long-term versus short-term effects. Why? Because most of your thinking happens in a fraction of a second or perhaps a few seconds, much too fast for any of the longer-term mechanisms, which usually take hours or more. Once we can simulate the short-term abilities, we'll know a lot more about thinking itself. Perhaps the longer-term processes are only artifacts of biology and aren't needed for thinking. We'll see. A brain that works fast and flexibly has to be a graph of relationships, and each relationship is a carefully timed, gated, and stabilized connection between cortical columns. STDP is part of the picture but it's only one layer. Without additional mechanisms to control, gate, and represent knowledge, you can't get human-like intelligence. In future videos, we'll explore exactly how this graph structure can evolve, how concepts are selected, and how forgetting, reinforcement, and reasoning all emerge from a biologically inspired architecture. This will lead up to a complete model of how your brain works. If these ideas resonate with you, if you want to see where they lead, please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, because the YouTube algorithm won't surface videos like this unless you ask for them. And if you want to dig deeper, join the Future AI Society. It's free and help us shape the next generation of intelligent systems, and you can participate in our online conversations. And as always, thanks for watching.